So I trust everyone can see that okay. Um, again, thank you, Daniela. I'm really, really happy to be here today talking to all of you uh, about 3D, digital 3D asset creation to be exact. Uh, my name is Constantina. Uh, I'm originally from Greece, as Daniela said, and I'm the founder and CEO of Kadim. So what is Kadim? So Kadim is a... Um, um, Mas, uh, like an AI startup, and we have developed machine learning algorithms that take 2D images and turn them into digital 3D content automatically. Uh, we have been working with game devs and metaverse creators for the past two and a half years on two main use cases. The, main, uh, the first main use case has to do with accelerating uh, in-house teams of digital 3D artists in their 3D asset production pipelines. And so the studios we're working with are getting um, a 20x speed up compared to traditional methods. And the second main use case we're working on has to do with 3D user generated content. So imagine you're a player uh, in a game or kind of like a, a contributor in an app or metaverse. Um, you can get the ability to create and populate and contribute with 3D content into that game or metaverse with actually zero 3D, knowledge, 3D modeling knowledge. So yeah, that's what we're working on on Kadim. I will make um, a quick introduction on how Kadim got started um, through my personal frustration, actually. Uh, so yes, I am originally from Greece. I left Greece when I was 17 to do computer science, which was my passion since I was kind of like a teenager. Um, I came here to the UK and I found myself in a, in a class with uh, 200 male computer scientists who were all playing video games in their free time. And I grew up in Greece with no TV in the house. So that was a big cultural change for me. Uh, uh, so fast forward, I started doing a lot of, um, I started being a lot of uh, interested in the combination of art and technology, why my, my degree. And I started taking units such as 3D modeling, character and set design and 3D animation only to realize how difficult and time consuming um, this form of art is. And truly, I saw there is a lot of you in the audience that are kind of like digital 3D artists, huge respect. <clears throat> so there was this uh, project that really, really um, stayed with me due to the difficulty. We had to pick a building, a physical building from the city of Bristol, which is where I did my, my computer science degree, and uh, transfer it into digital 3D uh, using Autodesk Maya. And this was my first ever project, so I had no idea what I was getting up to. Uh, and I, I picked the biggest building in the city, the cathedral, uh, which I very, very quickly regretted <laughs> when I started uh, working on it. And I realized why everyone else was choosing their bedroom or a small coffee shop. Um, so I go through three, three months of pain and uh, working day and night to be able to finish uh, that cathedral with all of the assets inside as well. Um, so after that, I was like, you know, okay, we went through that. <laughs> it's over, but we have more projects coming up. So I need the secret. And when I was thinking, where can I find the secret, right? The first thing that, uh, the first thought that came to mind was games. Why? Because I could see all of my, my classmates, they were playing video games, as I said in the beginning. And those video games contained hundreds or even thousands of digital 3D objects inside them. So in my mind, I was like, okay, so game devs have definitely um, got to have discovered, you know, the trick. So I go and talk to, to local game devs and I'm asking them, you know, what's the trick to making digital 3D assets at scale? Um, and they laugh at me. They laugh at me, um, and I remember still the, the day that Artman Animations gave me a tour of their facility, only to end up to a huge room with like 50 or 60 3D artists, all playing, all um, creating their, their digital 3D assets from scratch using a single cube. Um, so that's how I got super hooked to, to the problem. Um, uh, and that's why I then decided to do my master's on deep learning for 2D to 3D reconstruction, uh, which essentially was uh, the, the birth of Kadim. So let me move on. So um, since it's the start of this talk, I wanted to do a quick generation with you guys um, on, on Kadim. And uh, this is going to get generated while uh, I go through kind of like the next steps of the talk. And then we can look at it at the end all together. So 
I, I really love um, kind of like quick um, mid-journey generations, like, you know, the text to 2 d image generator. Uh, so I, I'm just going to Google something and then Daniela can pick like one of the images that she likes. So I'm just going to Google something like cute mid-journey uh, fluffy creature. And then let's look at the images. So Daniela, feel free to choose any, like, or anyone actually, uh, Scott or Daniela, you can choose any anything you like here. Um, ideally with kind of like no complicated background. <laughs> We're not seeing anything, Constantine. I see Whoa. your, it says quick generation loading. Oh, oh there we go. go All right, so any of this? Okay, I'll, I'll pick that very, very cute one in the top right. Cute chocolate travel. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that one it is. I'm going to save the image and uh, I'm going to upload it to the app and then we're going to continue with the talk. <laughs> well, you know what? I regret it. I regret it. I'll, I'll pick the one oh. next to it. That one that says generating cute. Yeah, th this one. This one. Yeah, exactly. This one? Yeah. Okay. Save image as. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna share the KDM tab now. Um, and we're just gonna create. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, so let's generate that. <laughs> okay, so you you all were able to see that, right? Okay, close. Let's close that and let's go back. Okay, um, so what is the problem that the industry is facing right now? Um, the problem is that 3D asset creation is super um, expensive and labor intensive to make. And for, for those of you that are not familiar with how digital 3D assets are um, like constructed, I'll, I'll give you an example. So the artist has to start from a, a digital 3D cube, uh, whatever they want to create, and then as if they were a physical sculptor uh, holding a, a physical kind of like block of marble or wood, they have to uh, apply all of those operations on top of this cube to start um, making it look and getting the shape that they wish to achieve. And here I have the, like the example of Michelangelo's uh, David, um, in, this is in Florence. And you can imagine that when he was starting to create this amazing kind of like piece of work, it was just a block of marble. So um, this shows you kind of like the, the huge labor intensiveness of the process. Um, so now when you go to video games, this is extrapolated to kind of like huge costs. And this is an example from Cyberpunk. It was uh, launched, I think, a year ago or a year and a half ago. And just the selection I've made here um, on a couple of like trash, this 3D trash cost almost $15,000 to create. That's all digital 3D trash. Um, so you can really see the problem here. Creating digital 3D assets is very time consuming and expensive. And that has led to a huge amount of trouble in the gaming industry. Um, titles getting postponed and delayed, uh, releases getting delayed. Um, you can see how creativity is lacking more and more. Uh, so you, you'll see a huge amount of sequels of games, uh, one after the other, where the content is pretty much the same. Um, there is no variety. Just because uh, content is so expensive to make, people uh, are very risk averse and they prefer creating uh, the same kind of like content that they know that it has um, high chances of being like a big hit. So obviously this is not a new problem. 3D games have been around for decades um, and you know, people had to come up with some solutions of how to create 3D. Um, although the process is still very, very much manual, there are some like more advanced um, ways 
uh, with which you can get some digital 3D assets created. So here are some, we're gonna go through them. So there is the NERF research. So NERF has uh, getting a huge amount of popu popularity lately just uh, because of the fact that it has uh, become real time. So literally anyone with a phone uh, can go around in a physical sp uh, space, sc sorry, scan, um, part of this environment and then get a, a, a digital 3D representation of, of the physical environment which they can navigate and visualize in 3D. So photogrammetry is, is used for, for that and it's kind of like research-based. Um, now, when you go towards games, um, we're gonna discuss this later, but uh, there's a lot of question marks, question marks on whether whether this type of research can actually easily be uh, used to accelerate games. So what's another solution? Photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is um, it, it's a very expensive solution where essentially it requires both hardware, which is what you see in the picture, and software. Uh, those two pieces are working together. Uh, the, the hardware to scan in a very, very high detail, um, a physical, again, item that you place in the middle of this room that you see in the screen. And then the software processes all of those thousands of, of very, very high quality photos that the cameras are taking and essentially comes up with a digital 3D model of your physical item. Um, this then requires a very, very high amount of, of cleanup because the process creates very heavy uh, meshes that are very dense in terms of poly count. So if you would like to put this in a game, then you're probably looking at like a day or two of cleanup per asset um, so that the asset is game ready. Um, we do have partner companies at Kadim that follow this method uh, because they're making simulation games. So this is like kind of like uh, uh, popular uh, within simulation games because essentially their goal is to simulate as closely as, as, closely as possible um, uh, situations and, and like items from real life. So for example, Rebellion games, they're making World War uh, one and two games and they are scanning all of the tanks, the actual tanks from museums uh, to put in their games with exact this uh, method. Okay, so that's a, a cool method, <laughs> but very expensive. And there's also 3D marketplaces. So this, these are probably the friends of indie small studios that want to um, kind of like create quickly, prototype quickly, and maybe create kind of like some concepts, proof of concepts for their games. Um, and you know, um, all of the assets that are part of uh, 3D marketplaces are created the traditional way. So some 3D artists um, that, um, created the art manually and then uploaded to these marketplaces for, for purchase. So there's also Kadim. <laughs> so the, 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 I guess the fourth um, area here is AI uh, for 2D to 3D tools uh, where NERF comes close, but NERFs, is, uh, NERFs are mainly on the scanning side of things because you do need to have uh, a physical 3D object. So there is this kind of like new area which uh, is starting to develop rapidly and where Kadim falls in, uh, which is like AI tools that turn 2D concepts into 3D, uh, which we're gonna expand on. So, before we move on uh, later, where, where do the previous methods fall short? Um, so the, the main thing here on the NERF is that it requires a physical 3D environment or a physical 3D object in order for it to be scanned. Um, so you cannot do it with just um, a, a sketch that is on a piece of paper because it has no dimensionality in the physical 3D space. Um, also, another problem is that the outputs of NERF very much like the photogrammetry, require heavy cleanup. And specifically for NERF, it's very unlikely that um, you know, people are gonna go through the cleanup process to actually use them, as it's probably easier to make from scratch by hand. Now, on the photogrammetry front, um, the, the equipment here is very, very expensive, might go up to like 50 or 100,000 to build uh, these rooms with such expensive cameras. And then um, follows the same rule with NERF. You need to have the physical 3D object 
with you um, in this room to scan it. Uh, and then again, it needs um, kind of like a, a minimum amount of cleanup that goes like uh, up to kind of like a day or two. Now, marketplaces are good for uh, quick prototyping, but very unusual to see in productions because they don't have unique licenses, which you'd probably want um, if you're publishing a game. And that's why um, like games will prefer to have an in-house 2D, 2D art production, which will then give them that like uniform and style on brand for their game. Um, uh, so then they would need to actually get 3D modelers to recreate that in 3D. Okay, so we, we can see a gap here, which is what if you don't have a physical 3D object to hunt? What if you are a 2D artist that did a sketch of a butterfly on a piece of paper and you want to turn this into 3D? You actually have no way to do this. Um, 3D marketplaces, you cannot find, find the exact sketch that you came up with. And then photogrammetry and nerve and all of those scanning techniques, you would need a physical 3D object um, in order to use them. Uh, so this opens up like the AI tools uh, space. And Kadem um, has focused, we've focused our attention in exactly this uh, gap here. So our inputs can be sketch or concept art. So no need for physical 3D objects. And then our outputs are 100% ready to use like clean topology items. So there is kind of like no manual cleanup um, required to then be put in a game. What is missing though is, the, is uh, color, it's texture. Uh, and we're working on like various uh, prototypes for texture capture as well from the input image, but this is still in the prototype phase. So, so what is gonna happen in the next couple of years? Like in the past couple of months, um, the internet has been booming with like all of this um, creative AI that has been launching. And this has made me like crazy excited because when I was starting Kadim uh, almost three years ago, the, the concept of, um, you know, we're making AI for creatives was pretty much unheard of. And I had very, very hard time explaining uh, explain, explaining the problem uh, that creatives are facing, both in 2D and 3D space, uh, to investors and to kind of like um, thought leaders even uh, in, in the space. And I'm really, really happy that in the like in the past year or so, the, the space has gotten so much attention, which it deserves, <laughs> in my opinion, but I'm biased. Um, so what is the change that I hope to see in the next couple of years? The first is variety. The second is less risk into making games. And the third is low barriers to entry. So let's take them one by one. Variety. So the difficulty to make content, and especially 3D content, has led to little um, to no variety in the style and, and, and the content of games that are released. So shooter games, right? RPG and racing games. Uh, this is kind of like the, the classic where everyone has played some of that. Uh, but anyone here that doesn't enjoy those, maybe? Well, for example, I don't. And if you don't like those kind of like um, classic categories of games, then you don't really have much option because the majority of people like them. And so content creators and publishers are going to push those. They cannot risk something being too niche. Um, so they have to make what sells. Uh, so all the niche concepts and kind of like more um, well thought of games uh, go to the bin. So in the next years, I hope that AI powered tools like Kadim will make the creation of 3D content much, much easier and cheaper so that people can start actually creating niche content and more end users being able to find an experience that they enjoy. So this has to do with the variety that exists. Now risk. So games are, are very risky businesses. Why? Because you come up with a concept, you think it's going to be the next kind of like a viral game, uh, but it ends up not fulfilling that pro prophecy. And I see a lot of uh, similarities between tech startups and games. So um, 
and technology startups in general. So it's the same thing with like hardware and software. So from the moment we uh, the technology companies moved from soft, uh, hardware to building software, they majorly de-risked the idea and the kind of like proof of concept stage because building software is much, much easier and quick rather than building hardware. So the same goes with games. Um, when you're building a game, ideally you want to make a lot of proof of concepts, iterate on them, be able to prototype rapidly and just you know, test your game with, with the market, with people, with uh, groups. Well, how are you going to do this if, if even making a prototype and making kind of like the 3D art for the prototype is so expensive or very, very little representative because many games will go and build prototypes with just cubes. And they'll say, okay, this cube here is um, a car, this cube here is a big, a big building, and you have to use your imagination to essentially uh, create the scene in your head. Um, so prototyping and iteration is actually very hard. So you, you are building blindfolded, <laughs> which is crazy to me. So uh, the ability to make much cheaper and quicker proof of concepts, as well as rapid prototyping and iteration, is crucial to getting games um, you know, uh, less make them de-risk games and uh, quicker road to publishers and longs. And finally, lower barriers to entry, right? So it shouldn't be so hard to make a 3D game or experience. Um, the whole world is moving towards an immersive digital 3D format. So in my opinion, anyone should have the tools to allow them to at least contribute and be a part of our 3D experiences. Um, right now, if you want to make a 3D game, you'd need to assemble a team of experts uh, to make something wor worthwhile. Uh, and this is definitely something that has started changing already with um, all of the AI powered tools, but it's only the beginning, I think. Um, and lower buyers to entry also lead, lead to user gener generated content. So obviously if we're making such uh, huge amounts of like 3D games, 3D metaverses, 3D experiences, isn't it? good for everyone, like no matter of background, uh, for, to be able to contribute and feel part, part of the uh, digital 3D world. So yeah, let's move next. So pushing it forward. So at KDEM, I want us to be the, like one of the main forces that are moving these changes forward. And um, I'm really proud that we have managed already to augment so many 3D artists with our AI tools, allow them to do more, allow them to focus on um, you know, polishing and adding their creative um, uh, like struck into the, into the 3D object rather than having to start from scratch every single time they want to create something. Um, we are also kind of like pushing forward uh, this kind of like revolution by allowing for 3D user generated content. So anyone can use KDM essentially to create in 3D, no matter their previous experience. Um, and, and the final and most important thing is enabling the transition from a 2D art to 3D content, which is kind of like the big, big gap I see in the market um, in the case that you don't have any physical um, 3D asset. And I'm going to be doing a workshop layer, which essentially we're going to do a couple generations from text to 3D. Uh, we are, we're going to see now our, our 2D to 3D, but essentially we're going to use DALI um, to turn random texts from the people who joined the workshop into images and then throw these images to KDM and see what comes out. And so kind of like a fully AI powered uh, pipeline that anyone can use to kind of like quickly prototype an IDH, new proof of concepts not only for games, but really anything you want to create in a 3D format. So that was Katim. Thank you so much for listening. And it felt like a really long rumble, but hope you enjoyed it. All right. Thank you so much for this. This was amazing. I think you blew a lot of people's minds <laughs> out. So um all right so we have one question from the audience guys if you want to keep kind of like posting on the q a um feel free to do so um have you seen that blender now has ai plugin with mid journey if you have do you know how this is different to kdm uh, have i seen that blender can you repeat that yeah, it seems like Blender has uh, some sort of AI plugin with Mid Journey, and so hmm. if you 
in it and if it's any different to KDM. So if there was an AI um, plugin with Midjourney, that would probably generate 2D images, Midjourney generated images. So essentially the difference with KDM is that we go from 2D to 3D. So essentially if you wanted to do the next step from Midjourney to digital 3D content, then that's what you would use KDM for. Um, I, then Greg says, I'd love to see a wireframe of the output. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I'm going to do a quick demo and show you the wireframes. Awesome. Um, can you do a live sample? That was kind of like the little character thing. Yeah, let me actually, let me now change the tab. So share this tab instead. OK, so let's look at the, let's look at the thing. Oh my god. OK, so this is the output. <sighs> Nice. And let's see the wireframe as well. There you go. Wow. <laughs> this is your character, Daniela. Yeah, I made it. I made it. You know, <laughs> this is crazy. Um, then there's another question. It would be interested. I would be interested to know how you respond to the criticism of Mechanical Turk process rather than generative AI that's been leveled at KDIM. Yeah, I mean, um, that's, oh, let me let me go back. So yeah, we do have some criticism where people uh, like don't believe uh, that we're using AI. Mechanical Turk, essentially, the Mechanical Turk argument is not viable because no mechanical Turk person could kind of like 3D model this. Mechanical Turk is for kind of like replying surveys or kind of like quickly getting feedback of like easy to do tasks. Um, KDM, we are an AI startup and we have, um, I wrote a response to all of that saying that we, we are early stage. So we do use manual quality control uh, to check kind of like about technical issues, eliminate triangles, and we have built automatic quality control processes. Um, but we do use some manual quality control in order to continue and evolve and upgrade our machine learning algorithms. Because essentially, if we see something that's wrong and we go and fix it, then we use this as a feedback loop for all the next generations to come. So we have built something that works well, but obviously we want to keep pushing it. And manual quality control is uh, partly what allows us to give to all of our partners, such high quality uh, generations and allow the, allowing them to rely 100% on you know, our, our tool for their pipelines. Um, but we are going to push next year an essentially high volume, lower quality, uh, zero quality control uh, model for perfectly fit for 3D user generated content uh, because we have a lot of discussions underway with uh, larger companies that want to use us for like high volume 3D user generated content. Where quality doesn't play such a big role. There's a lot of questions around like integrating KDM <laughs> with Gravity Sketch. Um, you know, like is the output a sub D mesh that can be brought into Gravity Sketch and edited? Is it a sub D mesh? Like, how do you like what formats do you work with? So the formats that we export at are OBJ, FBX, GLB, GLTF. We're going to add USD as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure if, um, Daniel, obviously, you know, if uh, those can be imported to Gravity Sketch. They can. So yeah, it's a, I think it's a powerful combo. So do, yeah. do explore <laughs> both tools together. Um, can you use multiple pictures to create one 3D, for example, building, uh, for example, a building with elevations? Um, so you can use multiple images um, in the case that you have uh, different points of view of your single object. Um, and essentially, this allows for greater accuracy of the output, if that's why you're asking. But the multiple images must always be um, of the same object from different points of view. And we accept up to six. Oh, OK, cool. Um... Can these be processed locally on a personal machine or are they only processed through the cloud? So um, essentially you get access through our web app. So there is no kind of like local app. Every, all processing happens on AWS on the cloud. 
Awesome. All right. I'm going to park the like, they just keep coming. People are just kind of like mind blown. I'm going to park the questions from the audience here because I do want to bring Scott Robertson to the stage because we've invited him. He has been doing a lot of AI work lately. Um, nice. And so he's probably going to have some, some things to say. Hey, Scott, how's it going? Hi. Hi. Good morning. Nice presentation, Constantina. Super interesting stuff. Um, Thanks. I think everybody kind of knows in the back of their mind that we're headed towards leapfrogging text to 2D and going from text to 3D, ultimately. Um, big question will be about textures and how ultimately I think those things get reintroduced. Um, mm -hmm. And are they going to be, you know, interwoven, do you think, in that text to 3D so that effectively uh, mid-journey, you know, color and texture is going to get interwoven along the way? Or do you think there'll be a secondary process after the fact? Um, so the texturing, uh, the automatic texturing application we're working on uh, would be an on top process. So something that can be separated from the geometry generator that we currently have. And um, in our prototypes, essentially, this is a much easier problem to solve. It has to do kind of like what textures can you detect in the input? And then it's a matter of, OK, uh, can we match them now to the appropriate, to the kind of like corresponding parts for its texture? Um, we essentially, by solving the problem of geometry generator with subdivisions, so because our meshes are also uh, segmented into parts, then we're like mostly done. <laughs> and so the texturing problem ha becomes much easier. However, there's different texturing techniques that we can follow. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if, have I asked, have I answered? Yeah, that yeah, I just think that, um, you know, there's the, there's the category split between sort of democratizing image and 3D mm -hmm. creation compared to augmenting professionals tool, tool sets. Yes. And so, you know, if you're a hobbyist, uh, somebody who doesn't have the technical skills, whether that be Photoshop or Gravity Sketch or Maya, then you're at the mercy of the machine. Right, you, the one, the one and done. That's that's all you get. That's what you have to work with. But how um, somebody who's trying to augment their tool set, right, could go and um, use the tools sort of at an intermediate part of their pipeline, I think would be really fascinating and interesting to consider. As yes. as because I could imagine having multiple output points in your process. Yes so that you could spit out a PSD that's got the texture maps. And so I could go into Photoshop if I had that skill set, I could modify, it would auto update back to your model, all those sort of things. I could take individual parts, reintegrate them into the model and gravity sketch. So I think there's two classes of, I mean, obviously the one and done yeah. at the mercy of the machine is the last one that will be refined and finished. Um, but I could see it as an amazing gray boxing tool um, for mocking up game levels um, for your specific, you know, application, but for all sorts of things. Definitely agree. I think that's uh, also a use case that I'm super excited, kind of like prototyping, iterating, ideating um, very, very fast without the need of like spending hours and hours on actually creating like 3D art, uh, 3D art by, by hand. So yeah. super interesting thought. I mean, Daniela was very smart to put sketch in the title of their company so <laughs> well it's a it's a debate that we're actually currently happy <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah so scott do you imagine yourself kind of like giving it a go and like yeah you know, yeah no super fascinated totally i have and i have tons of you know 2d paintings and sketches that would be that would be really fun to throw in to this app and see what comes out right and then um, even just as an underlay inside Gravity Sketch would have huge amounts of value. Um, because what you're really trying so much in um, Gravity Sketch is to retain the gesture of the proportions from the hand-drawn lines. And so that's still, that's still a challenge when you transition into 3D. And this sort of leapfrogs that and gives you a 3D base to work back over the top. So even if I had to go to Retopo, getting the, getting the proportions right from a designer's perspective, has huge amounts of value. Well, that's, yeah, that's interesting. And in a way, it makes sense, right? Like you're using something that you're so comfortable with, which is sketching something, just a paint, because you know that the proportions are right, kind of like in, in your mind, and then bringing it into Cadium, for example, and just kind of like creating that 
three-dimensional version of it as opposed to what we're doing with gravity sketch which is which is also really awesome guys but you know it's um yeah having to retrain your brain a little bit um, yeah I, I would have a question that nick nick and i were talking about nick gravely about the if we provided a uh, xyz wire cage which is the way that a lot of us draw in gravity sketch first could we then do the six snapshots that you're talking about and auto generate the sub D surface in your app? Yeah, I mean, so if you already have created a, a digital 3D shape and sketch in, uh, then you can literally just take screenshots of different points of view and push them in. Well, I mean, you'll be hearing from me. You'll be hearing from Nick. <laughs> Nice. All right. Um, let's jump a little bit more to the questions from the audience. Can you upload? Se oh, yeah. This one we already have. Oh, no. Can you upload several orthogonal views to output one 3D mesh? Yes. Um, for example, I draw shoes if I had a side view, top view, bottom view. Yeah, I think this one was already answered. So, yes, you can upload yes. <laughs> six, up to six views, right? Yes. Um, do you have any examples of automotive exteriors that you can show us? Yes, we do. There's a lot of automotive uh, use cases. Constantina, if somebody does have 3D sort of assembly skills at a minimum, um, say they're mm -hmm. not a modeler, but they could bring in the parts and then take those assemblies, I would imagine it's better to um, sort of divide out your bits and pieces, right? output them in your app and then reassemble them right in in an app so that you would have cleaner you would have cleaner meshes because even though you know you're going to get um you know parts obscuring other parts if you try to get it so all that's a super good question scott essentially in our documentation we we encourage people to separate um kind of like complex objects into sub parts and pass mm -hmm. them separately and then re um, attach them in their own kind of like 3D software. And this applies a lot to like characters because many people submit characters that have accessories, weaponry on, and this yeah. doesn't work well. So very, very good point there. Um, yeah, like the higher fidelity you want each part, like if you want really high fidelity, uh, like tractor um, wheels for a car, um, then yeah, you might as well pass them separately. So you get a really good wheel out and then pass like the skeleton of the car separately as well. But yeah, that's a really good use case. Can you share any details on the images you use to train your alg algorithm? We train on 3D models. <laughs> and our data is kind of like a threefold. We have our own synthetic data um, uh, like generator, which we've built. Um, and we also use um, 3D models uh, from really anywhere we can find them. But we do have a cleaning process uh, that needs to apply first. Okay. Um, <laughs> they keep asking if they if they can see the example of the car exterior. Do you have it available with you or? Let me find an account. Though. Oh yeah, I found the car. I found the car. Um, nice. It's a truck. Can I share the truck? I can't find the car right now in this account. <laughs> um, would you ever consider three D file variation generation? So like inputting three D so that you get another three D file. Um, 3D to 3D, that's a really good idea. So when I was starting Kadium, I had uh, essentially three options in mind. Uh, the first was text to 3D. <laughs> uh, the second was 2D to 3D, and the third was 3D to 3D. And essentially, we went with 2D to 3D because I started speaking with all of the game devs, and all of the game devs were like, oh, yeah, we start with 2D concept art. And I was like, okay, then perfect. Here's my answer. We're going to do 2D to 3D. Uh, but actually, variation is a really interesting one. And I am personally really interested in it. So yeah, I think we are we have been discussing this a lot in-house. And I think we're going to do something um, in the near future. Nice. So here's the input and here's the output on a car. So well, there's a there's a there's a vehicle, guys. Um, <laughs> there's a really there's a really funny one here, Scott. And this one's kind of for you. It's for both of you. Could you grab a sketch image of Scott's 
of Google and run it through Kdom <laughs> and then and send it to Scott so he can play have a play with it in Gravity Sketch before his presentation later. <laughs> oh, putting me to work. Who is that? Thank you. Andrew. <laughs> Andrew Peterson. Yeah. No, I don't have time. I still have to finish my presentation. <laughs> um, so we do have some limitations. We currently don't do realistic, like real human selfies and real animals. But if you can make um, a cartoonish version of Scott, yeah, definitely. No. No, like no. they meant one of his sketches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. not, me, not me, literally. Thanks. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, any last questions, Scott? Um, I'm just, you know, I'm super fascinated by pipeline and creativity tools in general. Um, and so I've always thought of, you know, and I've been sort of tracking these sort of things a little bit, but it's really fun to sort of see where somebody's at in process. And, and I think it's important for people to realize that these are work in progress images and models and not to jump to, you know, conclusions that this is where our end all right now. It's just like, this is the beginning. This is not, you know, where we're where we're finishing. So, um, and I would encourage people to get in, to get involved, like to, if you want to help craft these tool sets into the future, I think it's important to take part in communities and help contribute so that, um, you know, programming people that may not be of a mindset like artists and modelers can get an insight into those minds and help to craft these tool sets so that they're more uh, helpful to the day job or the hobby. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's it's something really important. You know, if you want to be part of the conversation, be part of the conversation that builds, not part yeah. of the conversation that doesn't help building. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, good. All right. Well, um, Constantine is going to be hosting a workshop today at the Wonder Around session. So do join us. Um, I think it's let me, it's difficult to say with the time differences and everything, but it's like we have Spencer's session next session, like in the next talk. And then after that, the workshops will open. So if you want to give it a go there, like, uh, yeah, feel free to jump in there. One last question, Constantina. Um, is this accessible for people? Like, what's the process there? Yeah, so essentially, Kdim is a B2B um, company at the moment. It's subscription based. We're working uh, with studios. Um, to, to on those main use cases. But yeah, anyone can come on board really um, uh, by just getting started from our website. So.